Everybody, this is me again, Patricia Windrow, sitting at the Cable Easel with my program, which is devoted to painting and drawing from life. Exciting scenes, still life, flowers, landscapes, and uh, tonight, live, is a study of a barkentine ship uh, that is uh, here on Long Island and moored in Greenport. And it's uh, quite a beautiful uh, thing to look upon, a uh, tall masted sailing ship. There it is, uh, shot by our camera crew. And uh, for the subject matter tonight, this is it. Um, I'm looking not at a still picture, but at a live shot. You can tell by the boats bobbing around on the water. But for the most part, this is going to be a very complex study of a highly romantic subject matter, which has never failed to uh, intrigue anybody who likes to look at paintings. Uh, there are good ones and bad ones of sailing boats, but this one, let's hope, is going to be just a nice demonstration of how you go about uh, drawing and painting something as complex as this. As the time goes by, I will tell you what little I know about the boat, and also whether or not you uh, might find it interesting to support the saving of this boat, which is called the Regina Maris, uh, translated, of course, from the Latin meaning Queen of the Seas. It's, um, it's a boat that is almost 100 years old, and it needs to have some friends. And so now I'm going to, you know, just as I jabber away at you and bumble along and try to uh, do this study, this Maris marine painting, there are the possibility of your phone calls, which uh, maybe we can talk about this or talk about painting in general. So do call if you can. 348-6800 is the number. Now's the time to talk to me because the other times when you see me on this channel, I am taped. So right now it's live. I'm going to begin laying this out using the reference material on the monitor, which is, of course, something that everybody else can do if they have a video camera. They can go out and take pictures of whatever they want to paint and bring it back and project it on their own TV screen and then do exactly what is happening here in the studio. Not a bad idea. Anyway, the laying out of this particular piece is going to be very simplified at this point, just to show you how to go about it, to place it on a space. I've made the background dark so that I can sketch it for you in a pale color, and to place this, uh, to place this um, on the canvas now is about all I'm going to do because I have to work with the sky background first. But So I'm just going to lay it out, uh, the, the placement of the boat is what I'm going to lay out because everything else is going to be painted um, uh, over this. So it's just a question of showing you how to lay this out. Make sure that you get it all in on the, um, on the designated area of the canvas. This is a canvas board, and to try to make sure that you get the placement of the mast, which incidentally is 108 feet tall in real life, properly placed on, this, uh, on, this, on the canvas, in case you ever do this. But I'm sure telling you what is going through my mind as I lay these particular uh, subject matters out. Um, you would lay it out in such a way as to make sure that um, you don't cut the mast off, uh, which of course it has happened on my monitor here. But uh, we, we can we can improvise that. And then these are the um, the cross uh, bows here. Uh, I don't think they're called crossbows. If there are any sailors out there, you can call me up and tell me where my terminology is wrong or where it's right. And um, then maybe we can have a nice going conversation about this remarkable boat 
And here is generally the layout. This is all that I feel that I should do now because I've got to lay in the sky. And doing something like this in the space of an hour seems to me like a fool's errand, but I've always managed to try to do the fool's errand um, on this program by chewing off a great deal. And um, sometimes I can pull it off and sometimes I don't. But nevertheless, here's the way I, go, I would go about doing this marine picture. I'm going to mix the sky color right on the canvas because of time and because it's, um, it's easier for you to see that when I am in, in the um, in the in the environment and painting it that i take along as little equipment as possible because it's just too much of a hassle to carry uh, palettes and all sorts of things i like to use the canvas as my palette because first of all it's very immediately immediate rather and secondly it eliminates the need for carrying tremendous amounts of stuff so here mixing up some cerulean blue a touch of ultramarine and of course my quick drying white i'm going to um Put the, uh, put the sky color in. On a cloudless Long Island day, uh, the sky can be put in rather rapidly, uh, providing you mix the color that you feel is probably as close to, uh, to the true one. And I'm going to pull this white tape off after the, um, after the painting is done, so that'll give me a nice sharp line around the edge which is of course uh, just uh, a, a, little, a little habit of mine because I like to be able to carry these pictures by hand after I've come away from the site. I'm not always in a studio. I'm out there uh, uh, schlepping things from the car to the site. So I always need a thumb place for the wet paint. Um, here is the, uh, here is the, um, the manner in which uh, to begin this kind of a study. Uh, remembering also that the simpler the better. Uh, as in most things in life, if it's uh, simple, it's better. The, the more complicated, the more difficult it is to live with, and the more uh, confusing it is. So uh, the, the confusing thing about um, marine paintings of sailing vessels is the quantity of the rigging. And that has to be done in a very interpretive way. Um, trying to keep as fairly accurate as you can, but uh, not having the uh, captain of this boat here at my shoulder to tell me how much rigging there is on here, I will merely give an impression of what the rigging is. A barkentine is a remarkable uh, vessel. It is, was, um, this, this was built in Denmark for commercial purposes, such as cargo and passengers. And uh, its length is uh, 140 feet long. The deck is a little bit shorter than that, but the whole length of the boat, which does not include the bowsprit, is uh, the bowsprit is this is that great arm sticking out at the um, in the what you would call aft uh, uh, fore in the front part of the vessel. And now I'm not a great sailor. Um, my dad was in the navy, and um, I uh, have learned only very little about uh, about the sea but enough to know that I would like to um, be able to be fairly accurate on my information. And as I say, this is a live show and I chose this particular subject matter to do this live show so that I can get some, maybe some help from people. When I finish with this painting, I'm going to donate it to the Save uh, the Regina Maris and let them, um, let them either auction it off or put a price on it. And if it's any good at all, it could bring enough for a, contribu a, a decent contribution to this um, project of uh, refurbishing uh, this boat, making it in uh, fine working order in order to send it back uh, to the sea as a training vessel and as a research vessel. Uh, it has been, it has gone through a rather long and complex history, as most sailing vessels do. Uh, this one was almost wrecked a few years back, and then somebody else found it, and then they re renovated it. And so for the most part, it's um, just as romantic uh, a tale uh, as it's, um, as any boat has. Uh, we all know that boats uh, have incredibly uh, unbelievable stories as well as romantic stories in the days of sails. This boat, this uh, Regina Maris, took part in the, um, in the Tall Ships celebration in 1976 that went into New York Harbor with that absolutely unforgettable uh, flotilla of uh, tall ships that um, we saw either in person or on television. And this is, this is one of them. And it's one of the few uh, lasting um, barkentine three-masted rigs around. So it is vital that we find friends for this boat. And uh, I know that there are an awful lot of other projects which are far more uh, demanding at this time. 
But who knows, if there isn't some sailor out there who would love to see this boat uh, live on for a good dear many more years. Uh, a boat that's a hundred years old needs as much tender loving care as I would if I was about to be a hundred years old and I'm not far from that actually. So here we have the putting on of the background which in this case happens to be the sky. According to the uh, monitor here with the, uh, with the uh, videotape that was taken of this scene, uh, there is a lovely little stray uh, cloud down uh, on the right hand side and the lower right hand side of the um, of the picture which can be put in just very uh, well it's very interpretively because clouds happen to change but this little cloud is over here and rather and there's no other the sails are not up on this boat so a little introduction of white against the blue is probably a very good idea and uh, all the, everything that I want to put in on the sky has got to be done right now because the entire thing is going to suddenly get covered with boat. And, um, well, I think that maybe another cloud or two would help. It would be, uh, nah, I think I will be absolutely uh, authentic from my reference material and leave that little cloud as just a little fellow popping up on the horizon, which it did at that time. Now, in the, in the behind this, this is moored in Greenport, as I say. And in the distance behind it, there is a sort of a, the, uh, the, uh, an inference that there is a land mass back here. So with a touch of, uh, touch of some sap green and a little touch of, well, sienna, I'm going to put in uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, suggestion of some land back there because this boat is not in full sail. It's, it's, uh, it's moored. And um, the fact that it sails it down means that it is not in full sail, therefore it must be moored. And here, here it happens to be moored on Long Island with a, little, uh, with a little suggestion of land in the distance. Well, now what do we do? We begin to uh, draw and try to place the uh, masts. The first thing is, of course, in the area where the sketching has been done for the placement of the hull, uh, the ship itself, here I'm just going to uh, sketch it in with, um, with black because the boat is a black boat uh, and um, uh, if anybody's been up to Mystic, Connecticut, uh, they are familiar with the Joseph Conrad, which is probably slightly larger than this one, but this is still a remarkably uh, wonderful looking thing and I love the Barkentine rig because it is, uh, it uh, m almost always has a uh, uh, three masts, and then this uh, very graceful and wonderful bowsprit that comes out. And the bowsprit is the thing that, uh, to which uh, the, uh, the sails and the rigging for the sails and all sorts of other uh, stabilizing um, uh, equipment takes place on this bowsprit. And then there is, of course, the cabin, and uh, that one is down here in, let's see, right, just about here. Uh, and that's in sh oh, that's in shadow. It goes straight across there, and the rigging is the thing that is going to take the time, and so of course uh, that will be the one, th the thing that you're going to have to put up with um, while I'm doing this project. The uh, the details on a boat like this, uh, if you are doing a genuine uh, portrait of it, have to be extremely authentic. All I'm doing here is to introduce the um, possibility of anybody who watches my program to get involved in doing a study, a marine study. Marine studies are extremely difficult, but they are also very rewarding. There is no doubt that there is uh, that uh, living by the water on Long Island, as we do, that they, they, everyone should be able to sometime or another have the opportunity to paint boats of some kind. Um, usually, uh, the uh, a shipyard is the most is the most cooperative because. Um, a shipyard is where they are moored and at anchor and therefore they're not moving. However, uh, the regattas that take place on the North Shore and the South Shore of this, uh, of this island are, um, are just about every weekend in the summertime, so doing paintings of, uh, of, of uh, ships in full sail is another, um, is another prospect for uh, these painters who are, uh, who are willing to bite the bullet and get out there and uh, take a look at what's happening. Anyway, as, as I said to you earlier, please call if you, need, if you want to talk about anything or just sit and watch. It's perfectly fine with me. 
I don't have to. I talk enough already. I um. I uh, but I do enjoy talking to humans rather than to just uh, whatever is here in the studio, namely cameras and monitors and three brave and valiant camera people. Um, I'm going to place these uh, this mast now. The mast is approximately. Uh, midships on this drawing. So uh, approximately midships is right about here and the fact that uh, you that uh, you have to do this with a steady hand means that I should be using a stick to rest on but um, I think I'm going to see if I can't pull it off this way. Uh, see if this is uh, if it's vertical enough and whether or not uh, it's the proper placement. If it isn't, I have to start all over again. 140 feet is, uh, 108 feet is this main mast. I mean, that's one, uh, one jolly uh, fine piece of lumber, uh, I might add. Um, uh, it's uh, doubtlessly, uh, the mast has been replaced from its original mast of 1908, although I can't tell, and if anybody is watching this program right now and knows any details of more than just the, just the brochure that I have, your phone call would be greatly appreciated and possibly even the people who are watching would like to know a little bit more about this uh, very, uh, very beautiful vessel that um, uh, is, we are fortunate enough to have moored right here on the eastern end of Long Island in Greenport. If you've never been to Greenport and eaten some of the lobsters in those local restaurants, you have not lived. Uh, they're there and ready to receive anybody who happens to, uh, you know, know the way. And uh, Greenport is on the North Fork, and um, all, all signs after Riverhead will tell you where Greenport is. So, uh, uh, the, the um, Regina Maris, Queen of the Seas, is out there uh, waiting to, to greet you. Here at the end of this bowsprit is where I'm going to use this as my, as my um, uh, point of reference as to where this m main boom comes. And it, does not, it comes not just to the edge of this bowsprit, but it's slightly below, and oddly enough it sticks out way past the boat in a f sort of a funny perspective which, of course, I'm not going to question. I'm just going to paint what I, what I see on the monitor because um, there is, uh, there's too much in the way of perspective problems. So when you work from life, you paint what you see and uh, accept it as the, as the absolute truth. This one is slightly at an angle. Uh, why the, this particular boom is at an angle is, um, is uh, of no concern of mine. All I need to do is to know that I better uh, that I better uh, render it that way, and then we'll all be perfectly happy and think that this is absolutely authentic, which is as, alth as authentic as I, can as I can manage it in a short space of time. Well, there is the general layout of those masts. Um, the, uh, the need to interpret and to uh, try to make clear what takes place on a boat like this means that it's almost going to be a silhouette problem. I'm almost going to be relying upon the silhouette. First of all, the, the, the videotape is a little bit indistinct, and um, I'm going to have to use it in turn, but that's good, because then I don't do what you would call a textbook uh, illustration of this boat. So, I think I have a phone call. Let me answer it. Hello there. Hello. Yes. This is Dorothy. I'm just calling to tell you how much I appreciate your work and how marvelous you are. Oh, thank you, Dorothy. How sweet of you. Where are you calling from? Centerport. Oh, well, yeah. Centerport's pretty. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, I'm doing some painting down there along the, uh, the Mill Dam Bridge. Have you? Yes. In mm -hmm. what, in oils? Yes, in oils. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I'm trying to ca catch up with your... Uh, palette knife painting. Ah, yeah, well, <laughs> I've been doing some palette knife paintings. They'll be on the air pretty soon. I'm glad to hear that you're doing the palette knife. Isn't it fun? Oh, it's, a, it's marvelous. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting the technique right. Oh, yeah, but invent your own technique. I will. I Good. Will. And I thank you so much for introducing me to it. Well, thank you for watching, Dorothy, and uh, call again. I sure will. Right. Bye-bye. Good. Palette knife, yeah, delicious. I, uh, I'm very, very fond of that uh, of that particular technique, and uh, apparently Dorothy was introduced and likes it as well. Um, here is the the thickness of the um, of these booms, and I believe that's what they're called. Uh, I'm I'm sort of uh, putting out a call for help uh, for for the for the maritime residents of Long Island to tell me what these terminologies are. Um, all I can do is to give you the. Uh, the information that I have gotten from the card and from the uh, the um, brochure that is put out by the uh, friends of the Regina Morris or the the um, um, 
The organization that is called Save the Regina Morris. Uh, they've a whole bunch of people have gotten together, and there's a, there's a fundraising uh, effort. And of course, I can give you that number. That number is uh, it's box six four five Greenport, uh, uh, which in the zip is one one nine four four. If anybody is genuinely interested in it, you can write or send a check, as they say, or you can telephone them. And I can give you that number a little bit later for more information about this. But um, watch the show for a while and see whether or not uh, you are, can, can uh, arouse as much interest in this as the people who have begun this restoration of this remarkable boat. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't mind at all that the, uh, that the tall ships uh, sent over some what I call fake boats. Boats that were built for either the movies or for, the, uh, or for just reproduction. But this is a real one. This is uh, the real thing. Uh, we have here um, a, an almost, uh, almost a century old, this boat that has seen duty as many, many, um, in many, many enterprises. And uh, what, a, what a nifty thing it is to think that it is still alive because so many, so many of these sailing vessels, um, you know, saw their heyday and then uh, quietly vanished, either, uh, either for scrap lumber or just sank which is of course more likely more, more than likely the story for a lot but this one has been saved a number of times and obviously it was worth the effort uh, here i'm doing I'm, I'm working in a in a sort of semi uh um silhouette technique for these um because this is not as i said to you earlier a um a an illustration of this boat this is presumably a uh, an impression of what the boat is, and I'm using all these the masts as the um, locating points for these um, for these uh, arrangements up here on the uh, on the booms and on the masts. So here, uh, determining the uh, the top of this uh, the top of this mast being here and approximately in, in that position, the camera cut the top of it off, but that's not really of too much concern because we know that the top of the mast comes to a point. Now, the um, the need to give the bowsprit some uh, some thickness comes by introducing the uh, the shadows on it, and because it's a round piece of lumber, it is going to have shadows underneath it, and then it's going to be pale on the top. The interest of paintings like this comes in the elaborate rigging, which is of course what makes a boat able to cross the ocean, and what it is it is also what makes the boat. Um, able to survive uh, the uh, intensity of the open sea. Now, this boat has seen duty for uh, almost a hundred years, and therefore uh, the, stu the sturdy um, uh, building of it, it's oak on oak, according to the brochure. And the um, I have a, it's sort of it's sort of great fun. It's um, the, it's uh, the decks are pitch pine, and it weighs 270 tons. Uh, 270 tons, I can't even imagine anything that heavy still floating in the water, but it's also that I can't imagine anything as heavy as an airplane flying in the air. So that's how, that's how engineering minded I am. Uh, but uh, 270 tons is this, is this boat. Um, the, uh, the Danes built it, of course they were pretty good seafarers, and, um, uh, and I must say, they certainly did a job on this one. I have a call. Good. Hello there. Tell me who you are, please. Yes, good evening. My name is Nick. Hello, Nick. How are you? Fine. I live in Oakdale. Yes. And first of all, I'd like to tell you how much I enjoy your show. Thank you. And second of all, I started getting into uh, painting. Yes. I've dabbled with uh, oils many, many years ago, and I find it very frustrating <laughs> to, <laughs> to get back into it Welcome again. to the club, Nick. Right. Um, have you ever done anything with watercolor? Well, you know, uh, y yes, I have, and I was smart enough to realize that if this planet uh, saw a man called Winslow Homer and uh, saw what he could do with watercolor that you give up immediately because the past mastership of Mr. Homer is the one that wanted me to make do watercolors. I have done them. They're extremely difficult, right. and I find myself uh, much more drawn to oil. Right. I, I tend to agree with you. But what advice would you have for someone getting back into uh, painting again? Um, just experiment with, because uh, I'm somewhat intimidated by the canvas right now, and I, I, I watch you, and it just comes so naturally for you. Um, well, Nick, don't be fooled. I mean, I've probably been at this painting for as long as you've been alive. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I've, got to, I've got to be able to accomplish a lot on this program in a short space of time, but every time I sit in front of a canvas, 
I have the same problem. Can I pull this off? Uh -huh. But I am self-taught, as you may know. I have never had a lesson in my whole life, not even in drawing. So it's experiment. And uh, the joke that I always make is that if you are self-taught, you don't run the risk of, of a bad teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the only thing I can tell you is allot yourself some time, space, and uh, if your desire is to do it, uh, you'll do it no matter what. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's, um, it's an obsession. Yeah. Uh, so dabbling is one thing, but my advice is don't dabble, That's jump good. in and slave at it. Yeah. You know, Nick? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks for calling. I'm sure glad you called. I'm glad you're getting back at it. Well, I, I, I hope I, I can become as good as you one day. Well, why not? We're <laughs> all alive and we all have arms and legs and eyes. You can do it. I hope so. Good. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, yeah, the, the, fa the business of, of, that uh, makes it look easy, uh, it's, um, uh, w what, is, uh, what is the most difficult is to try to pull this off and get people to understand that it is not as easy as I'm talking about. I keep saying that. I keep saying it's not as easy as I'm making it look like. And sometimes when I have pitfalls and I run into problems, uh, then uh, obviously uh, it's because it's bloody hard. And I'm doing this rigging now in a very interpretive style. I, I can't uh, impress upon you how important it is to just, uh, you know, bite the bullet and make those lines. Uh, see, there's one doing this, and then there's another one that's going like this, uh, and, and, and so along, all the way across this mast, and, isn't that, uh, and when this brush works well, it's heaven. When it doesn't work, work well, it's a uh, real torture. But anyway, one, and, and even if the lines aren't complete, when you do this kind of painting, um, what you have to do is to realize that who is in there counting? It's like uh, the onion doesn't really care whether or not you make the skin uh, absolutely translucent. Uh, what, you, what, who, what you should care about is whether or not you are doing a nice impression of this remarkable structure. Man-made, of course. Uh, nature, is, uh, nature does some things that are pretty amazing, but when mankind can do this, you've got to realize that we've got ourselves a real, a real, um, a real effort here. So, um, I would not, I would not for a moment expect anybody to understand the, uh, the intricacies of this uh, rigging. But what I do want to do is to, is to let you know that even though me, as, a, as, the, uh, as the pro, and somebody the other day said, you paint like an old master, and uh, somebody in the room said, well, actually, she's an old mistress. Which, uh, which made everybody scream with laughter, and um, uh, so, so be it. But uh, being a master at anything means that you have worked like a possessed thing about it, and you also are willing to take the chances that people are going to look at it, find something wrong with it, or they're going to admire it, one or the other. I see. Another call. Okay. Hello there. Tell me your name. Uh, hello, Pat. Yeah. Uh, this is Valerie. Yeah, Valerie. Uh, I enjoy your show very much. I watch it whenever I can. Good. And I met you last year at the Art for Open Land. Yeah, right. I was there with my friends, and I was wondering if you're going to have another show this year. Yes, but I, I can't, I'm not at liberty, as they say, to give you a date, because it is in the formative stages. There have been some changes. As you know, they, they went from Channel 6 to Channel 1, and there are other people in charge, and so um, there is certainly a plan for Art for Open Lands, but I think it's going to be later in the year. Uh-huh. So, I mean, the, the, there, there is certainly a plan to do it, but um, I sort of opened my big mouth a little while back and made some, made some announcements, and they weren't so at all because of the changes in the, ad, in the administration. Not that it's been taken off the books, but it's definitely going to be there. Oh, good. But we don't know when. Okay, well, I'll be looking forward for an announcement. Good. Uh, please do, and um, I'll be glad to see you again, Valerie. Yes. <laughs> when you come. Okay. Good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, putting this rigging up is probably a lot easier than when a poor fellow has to go run up there and start to, um, uh, start to do this all by hand. Can you imagine understanding what all this is doing? Every one of these things has got a reason. I mean, they don't, they don't string these things up here to hang the laundry on. There's a reason for every single one of these things. Okay. And so I'm doing, uh, I'm doing what they say, I'm doing the best I can with, uh, with an incomprehensible pattern. Uh, they, they, I see that some of these, this rigging comes in twos, and of course the absolute nightmare of rigging takes place over here at the end of the bowsprit uh, w with, a, uh, with an absolute jumble. It's like a spider's web, but it's all got a meaning, and there are just endless numbers of these ropes, so you can imagine the amount of pressure and the amount of um, uh, stress that is on, on a sailing vessel when it gets out there 
in uh, the environment, as it were, uh, which is, of course, unrelenting. And um, everybody who has ever been to sea knows that uh, you are at the mercy of many things which are uh, all-powerful. So uh, the, um, that's the understanding that I have when I look at this rigging, that it's done uh, with incredible amounts of, um, of need for uh, strength and, um, and uh, stress. So this, this net here is obviously because it's, um, it's uh, going to pull in things, it's going to uh, either be fishing or it's a commercial something, but these nets are wonderful and they have this uh, sort of marvelous pattern that is dark against the sky and then pale against the dark boat. So I'll see if I can pull that off because the netting goes uh, it, and, it's, and it, follows the, it follows the curve of, of something which is rounded and um, it also, uh, it also uh, transects the dark part and becomes pale, which is one of the reasons that I suppose I'm interested in oils because uh, you can do that with opaque color. With watercolors, it's, uh, it's different. You have to, um, oh, you've got to anticipate the whites, and that was in response to my friend who just called. Okay, well, there is a signal here to take a short break, which I'll do uh, when I see, as, as I try to, um, to organize myself and see <laughs> how many more of these ropes I can possibly string. So don't go too far away. I'll be right back. again with the um, with the continuation of a study of a very complex piece and uh, um, but in the end who can resist uh, the painting of a sailing boat uh, whether it's in full sail or at anchor in the harbor it is still one of those uh, wonderful symbols of a time gone by where if you happen to own one or you're on one there is a an untold and un indescribable freedom of the human being being on the high seas uh, all by himself. I'm going to return to this, to the uh, netting, which I talked about once before, whereby when the netting crosses over the uh, dark part uh, of the boat, it turns pale because it is pale netting. Otherwise, it's in, it's in uh, silhouette. And that's the, one of the things that I find so intriguing about working uh, with these opaque colors, that I can play these, uh, these uh, black on white and white on black games and, um, and sort of give you the optical illusion that this net is in fact hanging from the boat. Okay, I have a call, yes. Hello there, tell me who you are, please. Hi, I'm Margie from Great River. Hi, Margie. Hi. My husband and I are going to Williamsburg, Virginia in the fall, and I was wondering if your gallery in Virginia is close to that, could we visit? You may visit, it is not close. It's what oh. I would say, uh, I would say that it's probably close to uh, 150 miles from Front Royal. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, it's not next door, far from it. Uh, what town is it in? It's in Front Royal. Oh, it's 60, Front Royal? 65 miles west of Washington, D.C., off Route 66. Off Route 66. Yes. Okay. I would love to see you. Oh, I'd love to see you, too. Please come when you can, and uh, you'll love Williamsburg to pieces. Yeah. You really would. It's a worthwhile trip to James River, and is an absolute dream, mm -hmm. and I think that you'll love every minute. What a nice decision. Okay. 
I love your show. Thank you for calling. Okay. Bye. Bye. Maybe I'll see you later. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. Uh, um, the uh, the trim on this boat is uh, apparently it is white. It may be pale gray, but it looks like it's white to me. And uh, when, as you can see, keeping things very simple is probably the best answer to doing a complex uh, study such as this. Uh, and also uh, interpretive. The lines have got to be uh, I've got to be loose because, uh, as I said, we are not. I'm not illustrating a, uh, a a catalog for sailing vessels. I'm trying to do something which might loosely be called art. And um, at that point, uh, interpretation and impression is probably the best answer to to the uh, to the depicting of this particular thing. So. Here we have, um, is time running by? Yes, of course time is running by, more quickly than anybody would like it to. And I have to now pay attention to the fact that boats sit in the water. And this water has got to be shown in such a way as to know that it is, uh, that the boat is reflected in it, and also that it is uh, uh, heavy. Uh, whether, whether I can pull that off or not is, it remains to be seen, but let's see if I can just sort of uh, give you some idea of how to go about it. I don't expect that anybody who is watching this is going to be uh, foolish enough to try to do it in one hour. Uh, however, um, I am foolish enough to do it in one hour. And uh, uh, let me put the water in and then that will set for a while. By set I mean that it will do a slight drying process. You need to dry, the paint needs to be dry in order to be able to, to do overlay work on it. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to put the, um, uh, the, uh, the um, water, the color of the water in first behind this boat. Uh, and then there will be all sorts of, uh, of, of um, embroideries here. There's a little boat uh, uh, moored behind it. But I want to be able to get, the, um, get as much of this done before all of a sudden I see a signal from, uh, from the studio floor person here saying that the time is up. If I don't get all this in, then I, then, then I really get furious with the fact that time has gone by and I haven't gotten as far as I'd like to. Here is the, um, here is a sort of, the, the dock comes in between here with a lot of activity going on like pilings and so forth. But um, a boat is usually a mirror image, and um, the mirror image, uh, the, uh, the monitor uh, does not show you the, um, the uh, foreground as, um, as, uh, as you might like to see it, but if I were there, I would be able to, of course, be able to understand what I'm looking at. As it is, I'm doing uh, a sort of an interpretive rendering of what this foreground is, just because I need to have the reflection in here. Uh, water, when it is close to you, for some extraordinary optical uh, reason, is darker. As it's, it's, as it's nearer to you, it becomes darker. And that is an experience that I have talked about many times on this program. Don't question it, just do it the way you see it. Here is the way I, I am hoping that this uh, boat will look like it's sitting in the water and that it will have its, uh, re its reflections uh, as, as faithful as possible. Sometimes, if the water is extremely uh, calm, uh, you will get, in fact, a good sharp line. And then, but most of the time, water is not extremely calm. It does have disturbances. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use some ultramarine blue and some, uh, and some black and uh, try to give you some feeling of whether or not this is going to be, um, whether uh, it would go for a little further out than that, and whether or not this reflection uh, will, uh, will be, uh, well, it'll, whether it's attractive or even believable is what I'm after. I want it to be believable. There. Now, um, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing uh, about people who get involved in a project like Save the Regina Maris is that they um, that in a world where this kind of an activity uh, is not a priority, especially at the time at this time when the uh, there are so many problems everywhere in the world, uh, but if they did not get uh, have their incredible interest in this, uh, these projects would never take place, and we would in fact uh, have conversations going on about do you remember the the uh, Regina Maris? She is now no longer existing. So uh, certainly, uh, the saving of any project is worth is worth the effort, and uh, and I will be uh, I'll be so, I'll be so delighted if I can get um, some uh, some reaction uh, to people wanting to maybe contribute to the uh, saving of the Regina Maris and to buy this painting, uh, good or bad or indifferent to what it is, it is at least a document of this program. Uh, okay, I have a phone call, so let me call. Let me get the call. Hello there. Yes, hi Pat. Yes. 
Hi, my name's Dawn. I'm calling you from St. James. Dawn? Yes. Yes, yeah, I have Dawn. two questions, actually. They're rather fast. Um, the first one was, um, when you uh, finish a painting, because I'm a new painter and I just finished my first painting, uh, what do you usually do afterwards as far as finishing it? Uh, is there some kind of a spray that you put on? or? Uh, no, it's called Damar Varnish. And it's available in any art store, but you wait for at least a year before you varnish anything. Oh, a year? Wow. Oh, yeah. Let the paint set, especially if you paint thick. And if you start fooling around and put, put a varnish all over it, you're going to disturb that paint and maybe compromise its drying ability. Oh, okay. So it definitely has to be about a year. Now, what, before... Well, you know, let, let's be elastic. Maybe six months. Okay. Before you put the varnish on, then do you have to clean off the painting at all or brush it Oh, off? it shouldn't be. Not unless you hang it in the dust. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully my house isn't in that bad shape. <laughs> no, I mean, if you hang a painting in a kitchen... Uh -huh. uh, you're asking for trouble. Right, right. right. So you're not going to do that. Uh -huh. And you certainly, uh, I mean, you certainly own a vacuum cleaner and your house is clean enough to live in, so the painting <laughs> is not going to suffer. Okay. But um, uh, certainly, to uh, yeah, varnish it with some Damar varnish. Okay. And um, and that sprays on or, or no, no, a get brush? a brush. Oh with no, brush. do it with a brush. Oh, okay. Don't spray anything. Spray is a terrible idea. Okay. I'm waiting for the day when sprays will be outlawed. Okay. Uh, they do terrible things to the environment. They are also catered to the laziness of, of a lot of people who don't want to go to the bother of cleaning a brush after they've used it. So spray, no, brush it on flat. Do not do it when the paint is hanging on the wall, lay the painting down flat. Okay. You All understand? Right, you understand? One of the first question I had was about the uh, priming the canvas. Do you always have to do that, like paint over, or can you ever use the canvas when it's just, you know, raw per se? You can, but you know, you sort of compromise the life of the painting if you do it on raw canvas. Um, uh, paint uh, paint is, a, is a tricky substance, and it likes to have a nice footing. Mm -hmm. And footing comes when you prime it. Just like your living room walls. You wouldn't dream of putting the energy into painting the living room walls unless you prime them. Okay. And, and that you so could prime what? it, and then as soon as it's dry, you could just paint it over it? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. That was it. And, and I love your show. Thank you, Dawn, for calling. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the toxicity of these sprays is absolutely intolerable. So um, let everybody uh, l let everybody hear me. Uh, tell them don't spray things. For heaven's sakes, uh, use a brush. Um, it may take a little bit longer, but use the bloody brushes. All right, I'm going to put the pilings in because my watch tells me that. I have to give this boat its environment. It's not just sitting. It's not uh, near anything. So let me see if I can uh, sort of quickly show you that pilings are as important almost to a marine picture, especially if you are uh, doing it at dockside. This, is, uh, this boat is not uh, is, uh, um, sitting in limbo uh, in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle. It is, it is moored near a dock. The darkness of a dock is going to have to be put in first, which is actually the background uh, for the pilings. Now, the pilings can be put in on top of that. Pilings are more than likely, usually, a gray tone. They also have shape. And you can interpret these rather, rather uh, loosely if you want to, but you must give them a reflection. And um, the, um, the need to give the boat its environment is obvious. It, the, uh, it is not, it, it is not, it's like a vase, uh, it's like flowers without a vase. Your boat is going to have to have a place in which to sit. Here are the pilings that are in the rear and maybe we can interpret some people that are going to be there. The, uh, the, the pilings are going to be reflected as well as the darkness of the, of, the, um, of, the, uh, of the lower part, of the underneath part of the dock. All of these things make for an interesting marine picture. The, um, uh, the attention to detail, of course, in reflections is uh, all very subjective. You have to either see the, re see the reflections or not see them. I always see reflections. I look for them. I find that uh, my years of painting here on Long Island made me a reflection junkie. Uh, anything with reflections, I'll stop the car and I'll paint it. So, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your thing is. The, um, the top of the pilings are, are interesting as well. They always catch the light. And then if the time is right, uh, you'll see that there will be gulls uh, perched on top of these pilings. And uh, the light will catch some of them more than others. And um, then over on the side here, we've got some um, stabilizing floating logs. The, uh, the boat obviously needs to be stabilized in some way. And there are logs floating 
next to the boat, uh, keeping, it, um, keeping it in place. So uh, all of these things are pieces of information and also uh, they, are, they must go in to these pictures because if you are a recorder and you are recording an event or a subject, uh, be sure that you get the details. The details are what make these paintings interesting. The, even, the, the, even the log will have a slight reflection to it. Uh, over, over on the side behind it, there is a, um, there is a sort of a white boat, which I'm not going to pay too much attention to, but I want you to, I want uh, the viewers of this painting to know that this is at dockside and that it's got another boat behind it. So somewhere back here, there is a, uh, there is a boat which can, which can be just very, uh, very quickly sketched in. It's got a sort of a superstructure and it's got a reflection as well. Uh, and as I say, all of these paintings are not intended to be what you would call masterpieces from the beginning. They are demonstrations of how to go about it. Uh, if I were to do this painting, I would spend a tremendous amount of time with details and with making sure that I, but I wanted people to see how you go about this. Uh, there is a there's a, uh, a house over here. Obviously, every single dock uh, in the world has got some kind of a boathouse, and that boathouse, uh, the roof is manifesting itself up against the sky, a little bit uh, a little bit in silhouette. And then there's a tremendous activity going on always. I don't know of any place except in the dead of winter in December when there isn't activity going on near a dock. There is always uh, there's always humans hanging around. Uh, the seaside and the dock where the boats are. Uh, naturally, who can resist it? The, um, the, uh, this boat, when it's uh, got its sails up, there are 16 sails. Can you fathom such a thing? Can you imagine what an extraordinary sight it must be when 16 sails are aloft on this, uh, on this sailing vessel? This is a shed roof, apparently, for something which is housing all the stuff, the gear that people need when they are in the boat business. The, um, there is, a, there is a, there are uh, the need for incredible amounts of equipment. No wonder it's a, um, it's a sport which you have to uh, dedicate yourself to. Anyway, window in the little house, interpretations, people, and so on. Okay, let me, uh, let me get that call. Uh, yes, hello there. Tell me who you are, please. Hi, Pat. My name is Al. Yes, Al. Uh, listen, I love your show, and I think you're a great painter. I'm just curious, uh, do you use masonite a lot? Uh, oh, yeah. And do you find that as good as canvas or better? Or? Well, I find that it's wonderful for certain things. I think masonite is wonderful for very tight painting. In other words, painting where the technique is extremely tight and you don't want anything but really smooth technique. Canvas always has a texture. Uh -huh. And I like to use uh, masonite when I do flower pictures because I do them very, um, very realistically and I like to be able to get all the veins and everything. And masonite adapts itself very well to that. Uh -huh. well, Why do you ask? Well, because, well, I'm an artist, and I and I just retired. I'm a I'm a, a, a designer, actually. You know, and did layouts, and uh, and and I watch a show religiously, and I'm getting into painting now. Great. And I think you're fantastic. And oh, I, thank you. And I love to keep keep on painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I, I I intend to. The question is, are you? <laughs> what? I'll keep on watching. You're good. Great. <laughs> but that does, does that mean you're going to get lazy and not do anything no, yourself? No, not at all. Not at all. In fact, I, I'm, I'm very inspired, especially watching you. I think you've also put a great inspiration on me right now, too. Wonderful. Yes. Well, I'm uh, certainly glad to hear that I'm an inspiration to you. I never expected that. Uh-huh. No, you are. You're great. Wonderful. Well, okay, thank Pat. you so Thanks much for, for calling. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. Oh, there's a mistake here that I'm sure I'm the only one that sees it. Uh, this bowsprit, this boom here, has got to be in front of, yes, in front of this mast. That's the way I'm seeing it. Now, uh, maybe it's only because I'm the one that's involved with this and I have to stand behind it as, a, as, the, um, as the perpetrator of this painting on the world, but I also have to make sure that it's accurate. Now, a, a lot of stuff happens, to, happens up here in the, in the crow's nest and, uh, gosh, the equipment and things that I don't understand that I can barely even see. But I'd like you just to, to understand that um, uh, as a demonstration, my, uh, my desire to uh, show you how to do this stems from the fact that uh, there is an ever-fascinating uh, aspect to uh, painting uh, anything. And uh, uh, marine pictures particularly, I mean, Fitzhugh Lane is the name of an American marine painter of the last century. The most <coughs> remarkable paintings that were ever done of the, of the marine scene were done by a man called Fitzhugh. 
Hugh Lane, by all means. Another man called Salmon uh, did uh, some absolutely beautiful paintings, and they are all in the libraries, in the books. Uh, you can even probably get uh, reproductions in any good print shop. And uh, by all means, if you love marine painting and you want to do some marine painting, look at these people and, uh, and uh, study what it is that they did and how they approached them. Uh, Fitzhugh Lane did a, a painting of a boat uh, with an impending storm coming over off Narragansett uh, Bay. It was, it's absolutely remarkable. And um, you get the feeling of all of it uh, in these wonderful marine painters. The British were incredible marine painters. I'm not too fond of the paintings of marine battles with all the smoke and the flames and the ships' uh, sails being torn and falling into the water and and so on, but I really uh, think that some of the uh, some of the marine pictures that have come out that came out of the last century, the um, the the nineteenth century, was a great painting uh, period uh, for the marine artist. And uh, uh, I tell you, some of the packet boats that have been painted are uh, are still uh, are still the most remarkable studies of first of all of water, and secondly of these vessels. Uh, Winslow Homer, of course, did sailboats uh, in his watercolors off, uh, off the Baham Bahamian Islands for years. There's another uh, reference material, Winslow Homer's watercolors of sailboats. And then uh, all kinds of other wonderful people. But uh, the, um, and the French, too, they, uh, and the Spaniards, they all have painted uh, these sailing vessels. So being uh, completely taken into the into the wonderful romance of these uh, of these uh, things uh, is um, is my thing now so we have here sort of the um, well it's you know all the detail let me put some more in while I talk and hopefully somebody will call me up and ask me something else about how to paint these things but uh, naturally um, around boats there is water and around water there are gulls uh, just because there were no gulls the day that this, uh, that this um, scene was shot doesn't mean that they're not there usually. And so introducing gulls on, uh, on some of these marine pictures is perfectly valid, and, but you have to be careful of size. And so, so if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're not conscious of the size of gulls, you will find yourself uh, doing, putting pterodactyls in, enormous prehistoric birds that are too big for the time. I mean, for the scene. So, uh, a proportion is very important. And uh, I think that, uh, that a seagull can probably be uh, uh, shown with a minimum of line, uh, more, than likely, um, more than likely quite pale against a blue sky, um, and maybe sometimes the other wing is in shadow. So, if we just do a gull, uh, just a very slight uh, suggestion of a gull, uh, in flight, um, and, you sh and if it's very subtle, I think everybody will probably be, uh, will appreciate the subtlety of it. Five minutes, okay, oh, well, you never can tell. And there are going to be people here, so let me just see if I can interpret uh, people uh, walking on the dock, and they're going to probably be silly, but they have to be there, because people give you a sense of scale. How big is this boat? Well, the way you're going to be able to find out how big the boat is, by, is by introducing human beings. We all know the size of a human. Therefore, uh, always try to get people in. Uh, the um, the need to understand that uh, if you don't if you don't show the size of a house by the size of the tree next to it, you're going to uh, you're going to be um, lacking information for your viewer. So here on the dock. Let's say that there is a, a little crowd of people, uh, uh, much more detail. If I had f more than five minutes left, I'd probably be able to tell you. But um, uh, the, the mere fact that you think that you see somebody there will give you some idea of the size of this boat. Um, the phone number is 472-2121 if you want more information about this, uh, about this project of saving the uh, Regina Maris, the Queen of the Sea. Uh, it's, um, you may want to just take a weekend sometime, go out and see this. It's moored in Greenport, Long Island. There is, um, there is, uh, it's open to the public. You go in. It costs you a little bit of something. Let me see. What does it cost you? Uh, it costs. Uh, <coughs> well, it doesn't say here. Go, go, find, go and find out for yourself. But you can send them a check if you want. And the project is for. It's called amusingly enough. SOS. Save our ship. The Regina Maris. Um, this has been. Uh, uh, a uh, adventure for me because painting 
the uh, painting a boat uh, in in you know in public view is something that probably should be avoided at all costs. But I think it was rather fun, and I like the phone calls, and I'm glad that you tuned in. And I'm live at the last Tuesday of every month right here on Channel One for, uh, for to uh, to talk to you and answer questions and so on. So here. Well, let me see if I can put, I think, I think we should put a flag in this, in this um, even though it's not there, I'm sure it must be there. There must be a flag to tell you which way the wind is blowing, and uh, let's say that it's blowing in that direction. The top of the mast, more than likely, has got a flag as well, and uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of imagine that, but it'll just be an interpretive uh, flag here. Uh, probably, uh, probably the, uh, the port of call. And uh, uh, there is no such thing as a boat without a flag. And all of these, all of these little dots on the top of the uh, on the top of the um, booms are the things that more than likely hold the sails in place. And I could spend the next 15 minutes probably continue to do this rigging, this incredible amount of ropes and you, you name it, it's hanging from this boat. Um, uh, don't forget that uh, this mm, uh, program is shown periodically throughout the week at different times. And um, I, I'm, and most of them are taped when you see them during the week. The only time that this is live is on the last Tuesday of every month, as I told you a little bit earlier. I see that there is a green flag uh, flying somewhere in the distance there, so I just kind of, just kind of sort of pop one in here somewhere that it's flying. Oops, there we are. Who's going to argue with that? The little green flag is probably telling you which side is which. Well, anyway. Um, Save Our Ship. That's the name of this project. Out of Greenport. You may want to, uh, you may want to um, just go on out and look them over. And if you want to look them over and you think it's worth it, you can give them some money. And otherwise you can maybe make a bid on this picture. Oh, there's an American flag flying at the end of this boat. Let's put that in as quickly as possible. You may want to make a bid on this painting. If you do, uh, call them. They will have the information within the next week because I'll send this painting to them as soon as it's dry and then they can answer your questions about it. Uh, they will either put a price on it or it'll be open up for bids. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for watching. Let me see, where is that flag? Oh yes, it's, uh, it's some sort of snooping around in the back here. So if I put it here and put a couple of red lines in it, we'll know that there's an American flag flying back here on the back of the boat. And um, I will probably refine this before I send it to them. But I did want to show you that uh, the, uh, the, red, the red stripes uh, tell you everything, tell you that there is, in fact, an American flag back there. I didn't count the stripes. I usually do. But that's enough of an interpretation, maybe some bright blue to tell you about the field. Well, I've got to wind up. That's the way it is. The hour has gone by. It's uh, the same old story. Time flies when you're having fun. Thanks for watching. This is Pat Windrow at The Cable Easel. Bye-bye. See you next month.